to oh. him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. We pay homage to him and to the Dhamma, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay. I got it. Yeah, I got it. Okay, so now I, I don't see you guys. How come I don't see you guys? <laughs> what happened? Usually I see you guys. Oh, share screen, share screen. Share screen. And then. Okay, doesn't matter here. Okay, so let me, let me just tell you what we're going to do today first. Okay, maybe that would be better. Um, you know, I had a rough time for two days. And so uh, I decided today what we're going to do is I wanted to show you, you know, I just spent 22 years doing this. <laughs> and um, so my situation really is I worked really hard to spend those 22 years with Bhante Vimala Ramsey, uh, working in training with him, but then watching very, very carefully. How is he teaching this that it is able to be made so simple and easy to understand and immediately people are having the effect of feeling relief from suffering and uh, not in everything, but just about everything, they're quite amazed that they can get to a point where they really are feeling relief while they're going down through the path and into the experience where we reach cessation and we fall over and we shut down and then we turn back on. And when we turn back on, the mind is opening. Now, I wanted to tell you, actually, I had plans for next year. Yeah. <laughs> I had plans for next year to really have this so compact and so clear to understand what is happening to you when you are training this way with tranquil wisdom insight meditation. What is happening to you when you go there and you shut down in the cessation? At that point, I want to point out you're sitting for at least three hours. Most people go, I could never ever do that <laughs> okay but usually in a retreat with me or Bonti, you're going to start out even at 30 minutes and by the time you leave you're going to be sitting at three three and a half hours without any problem because we're showing you explaining all the reasons the, th the things that are blocking you from being able we're just pointing to do in the text to show you about very carefully about the hindrances and the blockages. And these hindrances have all kinds of names. Uh, these hindrances are, the hindrance is the favorite translation, <laughs> but the, this is a hindrance is a blockage. You know, it's, um, it's a barrier. We can call it a barrier. Um, we call it, uh, we call it everything. <laughs> any, any word we can think of that's trying to stop us from doing our meditation. Now you all know there was going to be another little book called the the hindrance is innocent with a picture of me uh, as a legal attorney in front of the judge proving once and for all that the hindrance is not bad. The hindrance is actually innocent. And that what's happening when you get into a problem with your hindrance is you have not read the suttas. And there are about 11 or 12 of them right in the Majima Nikaya that are telling you once and for all that when an obstacle when you, whenever an obstacle arises, the obstacle can never become a, um, a an um, obstruction. This is in 22, Majima Nikaya number 22 in section 10, I think it is, uh, or six. Either place is gonna tell you the issue here is that um, no, no, no obstacle that you see come up that you think is immediately an obstacle can become an obstruction unless you personally feed that nutrient. If you engage it, so the term, the phrase in the, in the sutta, the phrase is uh, how many times the Buddha says to them, how many times have I told you that an obstacle cannot become an obstruction unless you engage in it? Yeah, this seems to be the biggest secret in the world. I mean, we have these men 
that and mostly men, I'm sure there's women too, I don't want to be sexist here, <laughs> but you don't hear the women talking that much, unfortunately, on these, these Buddhist sites on the internet. And, and these guys are calling this the dark night of the soul. I have been caught in the dark night of the soul for six and a half months. They'll tell you stuff like that. Well, I'm just an innocent. I grew up on the Majima Nikaya with Bhante teaching us of drawing the information, which is in the index project that was going to be finished next year. Everything was going to be finished next year. It's so cool. Okay. Uh, but, um, you know, in that, in that project, it's very clear that he, he was basically explaining to me in the airport in Moscow when we were stuck there on a flyover, we got to see what a Russian waiting lounge was like. And it has card tables and straight chairs and bowls of pretzels and water, and that's it. But I had the Mahima Nikaya with me on my in-flight bag and pulled it out. And I said, well, since there's nothing to do, <laughs> would you like to go through the whole book with me so that I can see what you think are the precise sources of what you have done here? And we found 76 of 152 suttas were the sources. But in the retreats that he taught from uh, 2000 all the way until he retired this past year, uh, all the way to that point, we're using 22 suttas that have everything in it that you need. Well, this is my, my little mind is going, we have to get this smaller, we have to get this smaller, we have to get it on the napkin or on the little handkerchief or on something you're carrying with you all the time. So this never gets lost anymore, ever again. You know, because this thing that he has found is so simple. It's exactly what Swakato, Bhagavato, Dhamma, Sandatiko, Akaliko, Eipasiko, Opanaiko, Pachitam, Viditabo, Winuiti. It's exactly what he's told you. It is easy to understand. It is immediately effective here and now. Okay? It is inviting inspection. And believe me, by the third day of a retreat, you're wondering, how did that, how did that happen? You didn't go through already. But how did it happen that I experienced uplifted joy as clear as anything, and I'm so happy? And the interviewer, me or Bonte, says to you, well, why are you so happy? And you say, I don't know. <laughs> I just really feel joy. That's uplifted joy. That's PT. And I have spoken to monks that have not felt that in 25 years. Now, I'm not going to bother saying anything else is wrong and this is right because I read Chunky to you the other night, <laughs> number 95. And when I read Chunky, the one thing the Buddha told Chunky, the student in the story uh, with uh, in, in Chunky, when we talked about the relationship in the beginning of that sutta, the student was demanding that, the, that you know, he was studying something, uh, you know, in the... Uh, the Upanishads and the Vedas and everything. He was studying something and learning something for seven generations long. And they tell you um, that what they're saying is, is right, what we're right, and everything else is wrong. And the Buddhists sitting there say, did you see that? Do you know that? Or did you just say that? And then just follow the lead and well, what I see happening in India all over the place is, you know, you get a, a big t a temple and then you have all these kids and then they, the way they teach them is to parrot, you know, Baba to Saba Mangalang, Baba to Saba Mangalang, Rakhan to Saba Dewada, Saba Tapa Dewada, and then ask them what they said afterwards. Nobody knows what they're saying. Nobody knows what they're doing. They just wanted desperately to have a Buddhism when Baba Sahib left. That's what we all know about that story. And we, we wanted that to be there for them. And that's their religion. But if you ask the teenagers are the ones who are really upset and the 20 year olds who are beginning to have kids and wondering why are we Buddhists? What does this mean? And they can't tell you. But it isn't just there. It's not there. No.
unfortunately, that is a really sticky situation right now. And after today, talking to the doctor this morning, you know, I'm wondering if I have to get in touch with somebody and start to beg permission to really speak to the monks before I'm gone, because I won't be here to bother them anymore. <laughs> so I better do it pretty quickly, <laughs> you know, because I've been telling a, a certain high monk for years I would do this because none of them want to do it. And they say that because I'm an American woman, if I said it and explained it, maybe they would listen to me. I think this is really great stuff, you know. I've been, was a Christian for 50 years, going to all different churches, trying to figure out what was going on, you know, <laughs> for years and years when I was going through hell and back again, you know. And I never could get straight answers. But the one thing the Christians have that the Buddhists don't have is they are willing to sit down and talk about the minister who's not teaching what he's supposed to be teaching out of the Bible directly. And here we sit in Buddhism and a man who taught for 45 years, 24,000 sutras. And by the way, I proved that that is possible. <laughs> and he still had enough time that I proved it by measuring the whole thing in the winter time one time. We worked it all out and he still had 190,000 hours left to, to sleep and <laughs> stuff after we figured out all the places he went in India and we figured out how could he have really taught that many suttas and yes I believe he did and the other 2,000 belonged to the Arahats okay that's enough of that blah blah so what was I doing all these years I was basically wanting to get this so small that anybody nuns included hello would get up and just start teaching this because it's immediately effective for people, lay people and monks. And if you can get them to just sit down and learn this system, this the, the way it's all there, it's all, it, well, it is in one of the books, it's coming out next year. <laughs> you know, it was all uh, subnoted and everything, but I don't have a lot of help with this writing. You know, that's funny too. But anyway, what I'm trying to do is, is say we have to we have to get busy and seeing how actually compact Godama did. So what I'm going to do with you today is I'm going to take you through. I I do these things, and some people have followed this all through the time I've been teaching. These are whiteboards, and when Bonte was teaching, he would let the people give all the questions to me because he was training me too at the time. Now, I had to answer the questions or go to him and get the right answer before I answered you. But my way of teaching is to help you see it because some people can hear it or read it, but you cannot learn it unless you see it. Okay. Now, that as I've said before, when I talked to you, the Chinese had a really good way of teaching. And when I was in the Republic of China for three years, I was teaching English and stuff, and I lived near a school, and I went to visit the school, and the school on the door of every, every classroom was a little three by five card stuck on there, and in Chinese, basically explained, when you see it, then you, uh, when you see it, and you hear it, then you write it, and you say it, and then you do it, and you know it. And that's how we learn Buddhism, you see? So this thing of what's happening to it, the dilution of this, this it, of course we're living in probably the last swing, the last swing of a thousand years or so. And the reason it has speeded up and it won't be 5,000 years is simply because of the internet. It's simple. The technology's taken away probably 2,000 years from us that it would keep staying around. So you've got, you know, you've got maybe the end of this thousand years that's coming in front of us. And we're like about 2,600, 20, it's a, a 700 years. And you, by the time you get to 3,000, bye-bye, because all of the prophecies are written out. They explain how it's going to disappear. They ex we're already in the time where many of those signs are there, Okay where you don't wear a robe and you, or you show up in clothes, just a regular t-shirt and you have a little piece of a robe around your neck like an amulet and that's all that's left of the monks. 
or the money bag. In Japan, uh, the monks are seen on the corners with the money bag around their neck, and that's their money bag, you see? Or we put money in the bowl. That's my favorite one. We go to a foreign country to teach about Buddhism and by golly, we let them put money in the bowl. And I, I won't do it. The bowl is for my food. I lived on the bowl for three and a half months. I know the dignity and the meaning of the bowl, all the meaning of the bowl, and you don't hear the stories anymore. The monks don't explain the bowl. Nobody explains this robe. Nobody tells you what it really means, where the pattern came from and all of that. It's like disappearing and it all had meaning. It all had purpose. Anyway, I'm probably wailing because of today. <laughs> okay, but what I'm gonna show you is a whiteboard that every so often in a retreat before it's over, I will turn the board around from the people and while they're sitting and practicing, I will do a whiteboard that's like, it's like, it's kind of like a, um, a scripture chase, we call them, where we are having all uh, a pattern and you, you, the questions are there and you have to see where it all is. But I didn't get to put the scriptures in this one or the text numbers in this one, but I'll explain it to you as we go along. And you'll see the kind of thing that we do to have fun with this because the Buddhism is supposed to be fun. We're supposed to be the happy ones. So when you see a whole bunch of 30 monks sitting there like that, do you honestly think the teenagers in those lay people's families, do you honestly think that they want to go to that temple instead of the mall or hanging out or doing something else? Come on. Now, this is where if you're, I had one monk tell me, I'm so upset. I said, why? He said, I'm so upset. This is in Malaysia. I'm so upset because the Christians, the Christians are proselytizing. You should go to Japan, the biggest conference in the world. And they're actually using the word proselytize and they're trying to teach everyone to proselytize. We're not supposed to be proselytizing. Big news, we're supposed to be promulgating. So what is promulgation? Promulgation is learning exactly what he taught and then start to use it. Don't sit home and keep reading. He's going to tell you in 72, go to 72 section 18 and look at what he said to Vajikati. He explained it very clearly to him. I mean, you know, let's go here. Let's, let's just do this one. We'll go find it for a second. You know, this one, I'm talking about this all the time. This is only like it's on Dr. Majima Nikaya. It is Vajikati on fire, I think it is. Let's see. Yeah, 72. Mm -hmm. Vajikati on fire. Page 593, page not 593 of the Majima Nikaya. Mm -hmm. Section 18. And, you know, Vajikati is trying to talk to the Buddha here, and he's trying to talk to him about everything else except what he should be doing, which is asking questions of the Buddha. Now he's got him in front of him, and then he should be getting answers from the Buddha. But instead, Vajikati is talking about all different kinds of things that are inconsequential things. Okay, so here... One of these times where the Buddha puts his foot down. <laughs> And he says, it is enough to cause you bewilderment. Vacha, he calls him Vacha. It's enough to call you be, cause you bewilderment, Vacha, enough to cause you confusion. For this Dhamma, Vacha, is profound. It is, now listen, it is hard to see and understand, but it's peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning. That means reading. Merely reading and sitting and thinking. Subtle, it is subtle, but it's supposed to be tested step by step. So mere reasoning, subtle, to be experienced by the wise. And we all know now what wise means. It is experienced by those who understand the dependent origination, the use of it in this lifetime to understand how precisely your suffering is happening and how it operates. And if you understand how it operates, then all of a sudden you begin to understand how you can relieve yourself. And we don't come as teachers. We're not gonna save people. I hate to listen to people tell me, oh, I'm gonna be a teacher and I'm gonna save people and I'm gonna show them the way out. No, you're gonna point. You're gonna point. You should be pointing 
and saying it directly from the text in the Buddhist words, because every time we try and say it without using based on what he's doing in the text exactly, we're diminishing it and diminishing it and diminishing it. So it's, you, it's unattainable by mere reasoning, subtle to be experienced by the wise. It is hard for you to understand it when you hold another view, accept another teaching, approve of another teaching, pursue a different training, and follow a different teacher than the Buddha. That's the most important part of what's said here, okay? So we, we always talk to you about these instructions when you get them. These instructions are simple, but if you mix a different kind of oil in the cake mix, or you don't put the eggs in, or you forget the sugar in the cherry pie. Arr, 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 arr. You know, if you do that kind of stuff, you're not gonna get a good pie. You're not gonna get a good cake and stuff is not gonna work. It's pretty simple. So let's look at how I shrank this down and try to take you through a trip on one of the chase boards I hope you have get some paper and a pencil because or a pen you're going to want to write this down as we go through it because it's taking you it's going to take you steps through okay so we're going to go to the share screen and we're going to pull up the best thing we could do with this okay and i'm going to extend the board out here okay and then i can oh boy this is going to be tough Okay, there. How did I do that? Okay, Bonte, can you do it one more time? Are you making it larger? Or me? I don't know. How do I do that? Oh, oh, I found it. It's no, that's so cool. I, I got it. I got it. <laughs> Whoa, that's cool. <laughs> All right. So you ready? We're gonna start at the beginning. Number one, the, the pieces on this board, the circle pieces are the numbers. I think I forgot to circle number two. I'm seeing that now. But the numbers as we're following the chase board are um, circled. But there's some other numbers that you'll see as we go along. So let's start at the beginning. And the first part, first one is the Buddha's quest uh, for noble truths. This had to be, um, this was basically what was this in the beginning before he is enlightened and he's practicing. We know now by examining the suttas very closely, we know that this was his path for investigation and his path for testing things. Okay. And so he wanted, when he went on this, just remember that when he went on this investigation to find out why people were suffering, number one, he had to figure out what is suffering. Number two, he then had to understand the cause of the suffering. Number three, he realized that there were times when there was a cessation of suffering, okay? And he, he needed to see in all his discussions with people, when they come with a problem, what's your problem? Oh, well, see, that's your suffering. Okay, let me show you, here's the cause. And here's, if you had the same suffering, if you changed it this way, then you would experience cessation of suffering. And the path to the cessation of the suffering comes after that. He's developing that the whole time as he's going along. He's, he's developing this, okay? So we go over to number two, and number two says, how does life really work? And there's Kilroy. <laughs> Kilroy is hanging on the wall. Okay, most important is, what exactly did this Buddha find? And remember, he's a man, he's not a god, he's not a deva. He knows the gods exist. He knows the devas exist. He's seen the realms. And you can learn this too, you know? You can see this for yourself if you're, if you're able to get into the states where you can observe. Okay, what did the Buddha find? How did he find it precisely? Did he leave us instructions that were easy to follow? And can I see it too today? Because that's what gets me going. People say, how do you have this energy? Because when I start talking about the Dhamma, I think I start to glow or something. I don't know, but it's feeding me energy and it makes me so I can keep going, okay? 
So when we go to number three, the little arrow says right next to it on the left, tranquil wisdom insight meditation. Okay, that's TWIM. It has two parts involved in it. It's all in one. Because when I went to the elders in Sri Lanka, and I mean in their 90s, you know, when I went there and I talked to, got to talk to some of them before they were gone, okay, uh, and ask them questions when somebody comes to you from lay life that is vibrating like this, what do you do first? And they did it to me too. You sit down and you do breathing meditation for immediate stillness and tranquility. And you need to get that stillness and tranquility and start listening very carefully to the teacher. The other piece of this is insight. And insight, um, the way that he wants you to have the insights you need to understand, which is probably what you're gonna learn from this whole board, okay? The way that you get those insights is through his technique or method of investigation, which is called knowledge and vision, which has, by the way, probably almost disappeared, except for me and a few other people I hear around who are talking about this in the middle of the Upanisa Sutta. <laughs> in the Upanisa Sutta, in the middle of that sutta, there is a level called an attainment of knowledge and vision of how things actually work. That's what you're trying to do. You are trying to see exactly how step by step in what we're going to be examining one event at a time occurs, because that's how you have a chance to change it while it's happening. If you understand the the uh, signals, you know, this, which are the symptoms of what's happening. And if you look at this, it points down first, it says the objective is balance of mind and balance of behavior. Now, Dr. Premisiri, who's the head teacher in the Pali department at University of uh, Paradinia in Sri Lanka, up near Kandy. Okay, now he he came to the conclusion finally that bhavana does not have to be translated just as development of mind because he finally said for real, and he's an authority that I really hoped one day would say for real. And he did finally say for real, it is the objective is the balance of mind, but it's also the balance of your behavior. That is what you are attempting to create for your life, a balance in your behavior. So on the left here, it says the teaching led to mutual supporting, a mutual supporting arrangement between the Buddhist Sangha and the, um, hmm, right. I can't get that. Can anybody get that? <laughs> can you see that, Monty? I don't know if you can see it. You can still expand this. Oh preserves. Oh, okay. The Buddhist song, there's a, there, this is the arrangement. The arrangement he set up when he is passing, he's passing away by the time he's, he's going to Paranibbana, you have the teaching. It led to the mutual, a mutual kind of supporting arrangement. Okay. Where there's an agreement between the Sangha and the lay people, the Buddhist Sangha uh, preserves and teaches is supposed to be preserving and teaching the original teaching, the lessons he taught the monks are supposed to continue to be teaching, continue as they were to be taught, but you're not supposed to try to teach any of them unless you've experienced them as his system, okay? And the lay people um, saw how this was helping them in lay life, in work, in life at home, in relationships, all across the board, just the way it does what happens today when people start seeing how much this can help them and how fast, okay? The lay people supply the living requisites for the monks and nuns so that they can keep developing the meditation and preserve the Dhamma for the future. So that's, that's one part. Now on the mind, when the mind opens up, um, it opens it and sharpens it without tension to equal the highest potential of mind and person can actually start believing nothing is impossible. Nothing is and create 
valuable, productive solutions and ideas, and it feeds innovativeness so that you come up with peaceful alternative solutions for everything. It's very exciting to see what my students have done with this. You know, when they call me back a month later and they say, I just can't believe this has opened my mind. It's opened my mind to so much, so much. Okay. And then the next thing is it also brings about kindness, compassion, joy and balance if you're using the uh if you are that happens very fast if you are using the uh, brahma viharas for the doorway in okay and and the brahma viharas the the brahma viharas uh, we'll talk about the reason for that because some people might not quite understand it yet but we'll get to that too okay so the next part of it um you go from three you move back over to the left. Now it's pretty steady here for a while. We have certain things that we have to do in the beginning. And these there are steps, there are little threes. The book of threes in, in, in Gurdjie and Nikaya um, will show you where, you know, where this is um, where this is actually uh, cool, you know, where you have these little threes in the book of threes. You have the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. You have to learn the Buddha was the teacher, but the neat part about this teacher was he was a human being, and you're a human being. And you can do this the same way that he did it in order to open yourself up. Can you become a Buddha? No. And I'm sorry, but no, that's not there. Okay? Leave that one aside for now. If you want to ask why later, I'll tell you. Okay. But you can open your mind completely to the level all the way. You could, but most people don't go as far as an arahat. And we're not sure arahats can happen in this day and time because of the complexity and the confusion of how we make everything so complex. We don't, we're not sure this can really happen anymore. And Bonte and I used to talk about this. And you know, we figured, and I talked to many historians about it. Maybe 100, maybe 150 years is even stretching that the precise practice they were doing was still intact. But what got lost, that you'll figure out here, what got lost could get lost so easily. It was silly. And so all these thousands of years, but it was always there right in front of us all the time. Okay, the second three, you have to practice dana, sila, bhavana in order for preparation for your training in meditation. And this is another part that has been played down an awful lot. Now, this the shila is there, okay, the five precepts, but the dana and sila and bhavana is not quite understood anymore. And dana, sila, bhavana, okay, the dana is generosity. And basically, the gener generosity, the purpose of it was for opening the heart. It was for opening the heart and preparing it for the action of the practice. Virtue was the supporting, uh, supporting this ability for you to easily, if you're keeping the precepts, what they tell me, this is my students all over the world, are telling me that this makes you want to be more generous, want to be kinder. It's pushing you that way because you're learning to live. And the sutta that we use is number 19 in that one, you know, the Dwaita Vitaka Sutta. And the thing about the Dwaita Vitaka Sutta is that we know that the Buddha was trying to figure this out before he was enlightened. What is the usefulness of the virtue? Instead of being on the unwholesome side, what is the but it's the usefulness of staying on the wholesome side. And this like a science experiment, you know, almost like um, corks will float and stones will sink in a bowl of water for the science fair. <laughs> it's almost that simple, you see? Because once you start keeping the five precepts, okay, this virtue is turns out to be a support structure for the opening of the mind. And then we have to go along with what happens when you do that, for when I'm saying here is when you're keeping the virtue very close to you, okay, and you're and you're not breaking any precepts, it's a comfort for the mind. 
And by not breaking the precepts, you have no hurts that are caught in the back of your, uh, your head or in your spine or the hatred of something you did with hatred and revenge or something it's caught in your liver, it's caught in your kidneys. And these things aren't going to happen to you and you will be open to healing, open. And so this is part of the importance of the Shila, the generosity and the Shila work together. Now, Bhavana, we just said a minute ago that the development of the mind, but also the development of generosity and virtue in action, Okay, so it's it's the mind and the action that we're talking about. And the action is the behavior. Okay, okay. So now the next three is the Sheila, the Samadhi, uh, Samadhi and the uh, Panya, Sila Samadhi Panya. Now we hear about that one all the time. But isn't it interesting? We hear about that one without pressing the issue of the first three at all. And so what has happened in our system, if we look around in the, in the modern world, we've invented retreats. And then what's happened is when the West, when it came to the West, um, retreats is where you do this. So everybody goes to retreats. And we uh, there are several things we do at retreats that train us our mind to believe meditation is the most powerful and easy to do and most supported when we're at retreats so when we go home we don't have to keep the precepts when we go home this is just training precepts i had a little girl who wanted to be a nun and said they're just training precepts we don't have to keep them when we're not in training the problem for her was she didn't understand we're in training from the moment we put the robes on until the day we die our whole entire life is a training ground with everything we have to deal with in testing everything that we're using so this is this is an uh, up just, just an obscure trans for me a translation of this idea the panya is the direct knowledge and wisdom. Now, in tranquil wisdom insight meditation, some of these things are going to sound different to you, but as you go along, you're going to be able to, you need to test them for yourself because, because the one guiding factor when we teach a retreat in the very beginning is the Kalama Sutta. And the Kalama Sutta was interesting uh, because, um, and I can send you all copies of that here so you can all have it uh, too to pass around. Okay, but Bhante Vimala Ramsey and Usulananda, they did a translation of that that's very, very to the point and basically don't believe anything unless, uh, don't just believe something because someone says it or someone who's holy says it or somebody uh, from a particular something says it or because it's always been happening, unless it's good for yourself and good for people and it helps people and it's wholesome. And then if it's working, the basic message here is test everything, test everything. Don't even, don't listen to me. Don't listen to any teacher as telling you absolutely it has to be done this way. Okay, don't ever take that as interpretation with tranquil wisdom insight meditation. That is the most absurd thing anybody can do to this because we've been saying from the very beginning of working with Bhante when he came back in the nineties, okay, at the very beginning, you don't believe it unless you test it and see it for yourself and know how it works because all we teachers are are pointers. And I'll tell you a secret. When you start teaching it, if you've gone into it partially or gone all the way through once, then there are many times you go through, not just one. There are many times you go through, okay? If you have done that and decide to teach after just going through once, the problem here is you saw how wonderful it was and how it worked, but remember something, it only worked that way for you. And if when I taught, I was shocked the first time he sent me to Indonesia to teach uh, two or three retreats. And I had these people in front of me, all of a sudden I had 40 brains in front of me. <laughs> so I'm attempting to explain, but in those days I wasn't doing it from my experience and trying to do it from a, how I had seen him teach an interview, but from my experience and thinking that's how it worked. Why am I saying it's so important? Because for instance, in the text in the Brahma Viharas, there is basically taking you through the levels 
of the jhanas as you go. And those levels of jhana go one, two, three, four rupa jhanas, and then into the arupa jhanas. And the arupa jhanas are infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, base of nothingness, and then neither perception or non-perception. So what happened is we produced a teacher and we didn't even know it who decided that infinite consciousness doesn't exist. So he wrote a book and infinite consciousness doesn't exist. Later, I think he changed it when he did another edition. But you see the danger in this is we assume because we did this, that it has to be exactly what we're saying, but you're forgetting. They need to test everything for themselves and we need to learn to be open enough to listen carefully to everything. Okay, then number five. Number five is support team players. Support team players. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger here so I can see this one really well. Now, these team players are have to do with the 37 requisites of enlightenment, which is the, found, is the parts that you will learn as you're training in this. You will touch on all of them and come out the other end understanding most of them. So you have five precepts. These are the initial, these are the initial support team players, okay? And these, uh, the precepts are number one, to not kill or harm any living beings on purpose. Be sure you put that on the end of it. I don't want any of you going home and having a heart attack because you stepped on an ant, please. And if you killed a cockroach, I know how you feel, but let me tell you, the cockroach, you need to catch him in a little jar and put him outside because he really lives in the dirt outside. If you look into the who these little guys are, well, I lived in the forest for seven years. So, you know, who are these little people that live outside? And, if, you know, they have a special place they want to live. Put them back where they were. That's the best thing to do. And then the second precept is not to take what is not freely given. And we put this in there specifically this way, and then we found it later in the text. Nothing that is not give, freely given. And, you know, there's habits if somebody goes away, then everybody goes and takes whatever they want. And then uh, there were some things that happened during one of the wars we were watching, you know, and we were talking about this. Look at this. These people are taking all the doors off of the houses that were bombed and stuff, taking it back to the States, opening, a, you know, a, an auction center. And you don't want to walk in there if you're a sensitive person, because you can tell bad stuff happened where all this stuff is. And I couldn't stay in there. And we just, we ended up leaving, but through in California, there was a great big place like that. And it was a shock. And then I realized, you know, it's not don't take what's not given, don't just steal something, but it's don't take something unless it's freely given. So there's no residual energy on it to come after you. Now, number three is not to practice wrong sexuality. That's an important one. And not to pr practice wrong sexuality is don't do anything so really quickly. Don't do anything without consent, but don't do anything with someone who's too young. And don't do anything with somebody who's living still at home with their parents. And then um, the basic thing, if you take those three and try to put them in a little nutshell, just a little piece like this, you know, a little, you don't do anything that's going to cause mental or physical pain for anyone. That means mom, dad, grandparents, grandpa. And you know, when you get in Asia, that's a big family. And you know, if you ever were to get attached to that family and you did it, it's something wrong in the beginning, you have to live with that the rest of your life. And I've done a lot of counseling. And let me tell you, you don't want to do that. So just make it easier on yourself by abiding with things properly. Now, I'm not don't want to talk to people in the West about morality. Good quiet. <laughs> so let's talk about this a little bit of a different way. And so we understand what I'm talking about and what the Buddha was talking about. He it was not a commandment, number one. It was advice. And all of the things that he's teaching you through the whole thing is about advice 
for wholesome and easy living. That means smooth living without any torturous stuff going on in your mind or a lot of times in your body. So it's keeping you, uh, keeping the precepts becomes a umbrella, like an umbrella and it's protecting you. So what is it protecting you from? What happens if I, if I uh, break a precept? Well, let me do one more thing for the precepts for those who haven't heard before. I'll tell you this way, if you have a car and you wanna protect your car, you wanna make sure it always has five fluids in the car. Always remember, this is a good way to teach the precepts. You're not gonna bother anybody this way. You have to have fuel in the car or it won't go. You have to have oil in the car. These are the fluids. You have to have brake fluid. You have to have steering fluid and you must have transmission fluid. If you don't have one of those and they're out of the proper amount, you cannot go on a long trip and don't think it's gonna be a good journey because if you something goes wrong with those fluids and you're not paying attention, you're not gonna have a good trip. Well, if you were the model of the car, we take your name and say the KD model of the automobile. And there's not one car, not one hybrid, not one electric car that doesn't have to have this stuff in it, okay? Then you begin to understand that your car is not gonna run right if you don't have fluids in it. But what do they protect you from? Here's the umbrella like this, okay? And what is it that's coming down and hitting these things on top? What is hitting the umbrella trying to, it feels like they're trying to attack you, but again, they are innocent. Um, first one you have is lust and greed. And lust and greed is a hindrance. And what it does, it causes you to, I want something, I, I really want something. And then the action of, getting attached. So it's, I want it. I like it. I want it. Attachment. That's the first one. Second one is I don't like it. That's hatred and aversion. I don't like it. I don't want it. Hatred and aversion. Oh, there you go. Hatred and ill will aversion. All right. The third one is sloth and torpor. Sloth and torpor is tired and slow, dull mind where you're at work and you start drooping and drooping. It's because something's inside you're thinking about that you did and must have been something that happened that you're not quite, it's like uh, you didn't really understand what was going on at the time and you made an, a, a decision to do something that was absolutely wrong and caused all this uh, to happen. The, the result of that is sloth and torpor. Okay, the fourth one is restlessness, guilt, and remorse. When we break a precept, the, these don't come just as one. If you did one of the three that I just mentioned, the fourth one is showing you the results. And then that slows you down. So you can't think, you can't invent, you're not innovative, and things are not working well. And the restlessness is the movement of the body, the bouncing of the leg, we call it. We, I love this, you know, in modern times, we had to invent something. Too many people were getting involved with this one. Restlessness. And so we invented the diagnosis because only because somebody figured out a drug that would fix this diagnosis. And we call the diagnosis restless leg syndrome. But if you go in some places, like if you were, you were going in uh, some states uh, in the United States and you go into a... Um, into a coffee shop, the men are all sitting there bouncing their legs. <laughs> but if you go into a country where things are a little stricter, or it's just not acceptable to do certain things that people are doing in, in this other part of the world, and their legs aren't bouncing. Now, why is that going on? And one person said, oh, all people from this country bounce their legs. And I'm there, whoops, nope, doesn't work, doesn't work. I've tested this with two or three students. One student was a, a really good meditator of Vanti Vimala Ramses and came back after a few months. And we said, well, where have you been? Well, I got a new job and um, he's a salesman and he travels around the United States. And he says, every night in the evening, wherever I am, everybody sits and they drink and I started drinking. He says, oh, I started drinking. 
And so this was the last, uh, the last, uh, um, the last uh, hindrance, right? Was I'm sorry, where's the, where am I going here? The last hindrance. I'm sorry. Hmm. Yeah, maybe I forgot the last precept. The last precept was basically not to take any drugs or alcohol, and that one was uh, basically set up so that your mind would not be you not your mind would be clear and your mind would not get dull and you would not get stuck. You would be able to drive and you'd be able to converse with people and in a clear mind and make decisions and that sort of stuff. Okay. But when we get to the hindrances, the, uh, the one is like you fall into doubt and doubt, doubt on the end of this doubt, the fifth one, it really pertains to doubt you start to doubt the way that you're practicing your practice when you're talking about this as a development chart. You're doubting something and you have to ask yourself, why isn't this, why isn't the practice working when I'm sitting? And then you start sitting and your intuition will come up and tell you something in there is being doubted and you need to ask a teacher and uh, ask a teacher and the teacher will ask you another question to follow, follow around. Um, okay, and then, Let's see, we go to the next one. Okay, now it goes to, and this, by the way, this part here is the what you hear the very first night of every one of our retreats. They will hear the precepts and understand what they're about. They will hear the hindrances uh, that the reason the precepts are there to protect you that these hindrances don't happen. They will also hear what is the being made of. This is an important part. So the, when what Gautama was actually doing, Buddha Gautama, was he had to break this all down in order to be able to teach it. So he starts by saying, let's start with who is the being. And then he shows you the being is principally, it's five, it's five aggregates, okay? And what it is, is basically first, the first one is body. And the important part of body, when you say body, you think you just need to say body, but you actually need to tell the person, body means, you know, from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Why? Because through the 1970s and 1980s, we practiced calisthenics at the gym. We didn't have a lot of programs, but we did have those in the old days. And when we were doing it all those years, we were basically taught from here down as the body. And the, the head and the mind is not part of this calisthenics program. It's very interesting. It only came in later that we started including the head a little bit more in exercise programs. And of course, in sports and karate and uh, anything else, we had to have the neck development. And also in a lot of yoga, you had that. But in the West, we didn't have it at that time. It wasn't, wasn't really permeating things. So the body from head to foot. Okay. Now, the next one, feeling. You only need to know, and I'm telling you what has been boiled down that we figured out over 20 years of testing this. What is the, is the part that you need to know in order to be able to train properly and be able to get through the jhanas and to the end and experience an opening? And I'll talk to you about the opening in the mind too. All right, so feeling you just need to know pleasant painful or neutral and you need to know two realms for that so you have a mental realm so that makes it five actually because a pleasant mental feeling or a painful mental feeling a pleasant uh you know body feeling or a painful body feeling and a neutral feeling that's all you need to know about and you can actually get away with i've had people who can't remember the third one and i'm there okay Pleasant or painful, if you know that, you can get through the co more complicated suttas that are telling you how it goes all the way from the beginning to the end. And if you don't understand the kind of thing I'm talking about, you can look up the Chachaka Sutta and listen to me recite it or to Bhante Vimala Ramsey recite. The Chak Chak uh, Chachaka Sutta is 148, Majima Nikaya number 148. And it means the six sets of six. And the, what, the reason that was being taught was to be taught the, an, the anatta, the anatta teaching very, very clearly. Okay. Um, so the aggregate body feeling, the next one is perception. And perception, remember, just remember, perception perceives. 
And to perceive something names what comes up initially in the mind, names it. So when you name it, it gets named very quickly. But the Buddha looked at it and said, you know, that's happening so fast. I'm not going to make it a link in dependent origination. I know that in cognitive psychology and neurocognitive science, they do make a link, but these people are kind of neurotic with their scientific approach to dependent origination, which is actually human cognition. They started with nine for the PhD. And then when I explained something about going to 12, a lot of them went to 11. They were happy with that. And then, but over time, <laughs> this is since like the last 10 years, I've watched them develop it up to something like 27 links, which is not necessary. It's not necessary, but this is the world we live in. People get jobs if you want to hire somebody for your company because you need a solution for a problem in the company. You have two employees or three of them you want to interview. And this one comes up, we'll only need 10 more people to work here to solve this. And they think, oh, that, that's, that, that, that's, uh, that's pretty good. And this guy says, we actually only need one more. And he's thinking they only want, they want to take care of their money. They don't want to spend a lot. Just one more person and me, and we can fix this whole thing. And then this guy comes in, the third guy, and he says, whoa, wait a minute, uh, I can show you the flow chart I figured out for your company for the next 10 years. And if we hire 32 more people, we can fix this so that you are all set for life. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. And I know a friend who was hired into a government position like that. And um, he quit after about five or six years. He quit. But the thing was, he got the job strictly because he was trying to get more jobs, more positions in that whole unit. And I thought that was the craziest thing I ever saw happen in human resources. I had a company and this is funny. It's just crazy thing. Okay. The next one of your aggregates, you got body, feeling, perception, thoughts. Okay. Thoughts is the next one. And consciousness is the last one. Thoughts are just the, uh, the way that the thoughts just arise up and we say thoughts here, but we talk later. Uh, we talk in terms of uh, mind objects is what Bhikkhu Bodhi likes to call thoughts, mind objects. The mind operates the same thing as, uh, as the uh, sense doors. If we look at the next line, number six, uh, six sense doors. This, we're in number five, but we're looking at six sense doors, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, external experiences. This is the way we're set up. Mind is your internal experience. But what the Buddha figured out in the process of seeing dependent origination so clearly how the mind is working, he saw very clearly uh, that, um, oh, good. That's good. That's the senior moment. Okay, that happens. <laughs> okay. He saw very clearly that the uh, internal experience sense store, which is mind, operates precisely the same way as the other five external experiences. I hope you can follow me there. So say it again, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body. That's your external experience of this experience in this lifetime. That's how you witness it. But internal experience, how the mind actually operates inside, okay, that one is the internal mind, okay? Okay, now number six, we go to six and we're down here in the, in the middle, okay, like that. Okay, that's big enough. All right, number six, when we are here with six, I have a hand I can show you here. Okay, so how suffering actually works. Now we get into the nitty gritty. How does it actually work? Now, dependent origination, we, we got snowballed with it, basically. Okay, we, it is not something that we're doing that is new. I want to point this out. This has been going on for thousands of years. And people who actually get into the text and see that he was studying mind and its operation and how it affects your actions and your life here and now in this lifetime, 
we're studying it that way. So this is what I'm, I'm going to be showing you because we're interested in you specifically understanding what happens to you if something like anger or panic attacks or depression or these sorts of things happen, we want you to understand they might not exactly, it's not your depression. It's not your panic attack, actually. It's kind of sounds funny when I first say it. But the fact is nothing is happening to you. And when you start out and you really um, are at the bottom of life, you know, and you have fallen down all the way, you believe that's happening to you because of the weight of the world upon you. You feel like everything is on top of you. But the Buddha comes along and he says, that's silly. Nothing's happening to you. Everything's happening from you. And he walks away. And then you're wondering for the next like five or 10 years, like, what is he talking about? And here's what he's talking about. So we're going to give you an example in the beginning. And we're going to use seven. I think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Seven uh, of the links only seven of the 12 links to show you what's happening in this lifetime. And by the way, if you're talking Vasudhi Maga and he's talking about different lifetimes and stuff, if you go to the back of the Vasudhi Maga, you're going to find a chart back there. And these are the links that are in dealing with this lifetime here right now. So it's not, not something that we've invented or anything. So here you go. The example I'm going to give you is the eye sees color and forms, and then eye consciousness arises. And with the meeting of the three, contact happens. When contact happens with contact as condition, feeling arises and it is pleasant or, or it is painful. With feeling as condition, craving arises and that turns into the I like it or I don't like it mind. And it can move into I want it or I don't want it mind and attachment or aversion. Because when craving arises with craving as condition, clinging jumps in the untrained mind. And all of the stories about why I like or dislike the feeling that came up comes through. And those, what that involves is all the feelings, imagination. It's the stories about why, the stories about why you don't. Um, all the thoughts, opinions, ideas, concepts, imagination about why you like or dislike something. And it's what prepares you to jump in and start a story running in your mind here. And with clinging as condition, habitual tendency, reaction for reaction, that, that jumps up. Now, this place is in your head, and it's somewhere in there. <laughs> Very scientific. It's in your head somewhere. And when you get confused about it, and it's, stuff is really bothering you, it hurts at the base of your skull, right in the middle, in the base of your skull. And it can be a headache that goes around like this from either side. And it's when you are, uh, but the thing is, this is usually happening so wickedly fast. What you're doing is over 85 or 90% of your behavior in life is a reaction. And this is where the reaction comes from. And the reaction, it's, it's a reaction library of past events. Our life is driven. The suffering is driven, pushed through and pushed along by grabbing a card from the past and then jumping into the birth of the reaction, the repeat looping and play it again, Sam, the same reaction again and again in relationships, in business relationships, in everything that we go through in life and our families, just everything. So the biggest problem for us is we need to stop and pause and learn a lesson from a sutta that is in uh, the Majima Nikaya. And it's a very interesting sutta. You should investigate it yourself because it's 131, but it's also 132, 133, and 134. And it's a freak incident that this sutta 
appears, we have other suttas, okay, that might appear like in the Samyutta Nikaya and show up again uh, as a sutta with a different name in Anguttara Nikaya. But we don't, what we don't seem to have anywhere so much is to have the same exact sutta happening four times in a row and kept next to each other in full text, like we see these, these suttas here, okay? And so what is the big thing that is the most important part of that sutta is a lesson on the past and the future, okay? And, um, and way, the way it works is it has a little prose in here. And the prose is interesting. I investigated it when I was in Sri Lanka. And um, I was told that the monks, uh, originally, the older monks told me that when they were young, everyone had to memorize part of this because they went village to village and they wanted to make sure everyone knew this lesson. And they would recite this, let not a person revive the past or on the future build his hopes for the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. Instead, with insight, let him see each presently arisen state. So we know what you're supposed to be doing is watching the arising states and seeing how they work. Let him know that state and be sure of it invincibly and unshakably. And then how important is this? Well, today the effort must be made because tomorrow death may come, who knows? Okay, no bargain with mortality can keep him and his hordes away. But one who dwells thus ardently, relentlessly by day and by night. And that doesn't mean sitting in meditation away from people just in a closet or the attic or uh, away from the world either. It means when it says dwells thus ardently, relentlessly by day and by night, it is he, the peaceful sage, is said, who has a single excellent night. You sleep very soundly because you're using your practice. You're learning something about this practice we're talking about. You're learning that um, this practice was not meant just to be taught in meditation retreats or for you to go and read about major in apology, keep reading and reading. This was something to open up the whole world, all of humanity and change it. And the only way that can happen is if you keep using it all the time. And if you keep smiling all the time and you work, you know, the more you smile now it, and it makes everything lighter, even when there's a tough situation, you keep smiling. I mean, I think I told you guys um, when the doctor first looked at me, the first time I really had heard somebody say, you know, you, you really, you have cancer and I'm there. Okay. So what do we do about that now? And he, he, he said, you know, you're not upset. And I'm, no, I mean, you're, I'm, I'm, he's basically, you are terminal. It was the first time someone said that. And I looked at him and I said, well, you're terminal, aren't you? And the nurse is terminal. So what's new? We're all terminal. So when you say somebody's terminal, that just kind of, you know, and really you shouldn't believe what they're saying time-wise anyway. If they tell me, you know, tomorrow if they have this meeting they're supposed to have and they say, well, you have this. You know, you never believe the number they give you. Just keep going. Okay. That's what you do. Okay. So what happens here is once you have that, that um, habitual tendency the birth of reaction card, you pull it out real quick and you go over here and you have the birth of reaction happens. And that birth of reaction goes out sometimes without even thinking. And you just didn't really understand what was happening in this event at all. And you didn't take any consideration in the other person in the, in the exchange, like, you know, maybe their cat died last Friday or it's Monday morning and they're really off or something terrible happened to someone and you're not considering both sides of everything, you see. Then the suffering happens and the suffering in the event is what really taking uh, personally what is happening is Atta and seeing things impersonally is Anatta. Now this is different because I want you to understand 
if you were to write or ask me, why am I saying that? Okay, self and no self was extremely destructive as a translation for us in, D in, in Buddhism. It just doesn't explain self and no self sent thousands of people away from Buddhism. So they wouldn't even look at it simply because they didn't understand what that meant. But if you were to look at the consequence of believing that you are a self and everything is about you, then you see the danger of narcissism. And then you see the danger of taking everything too personally and suffering constantly with you know, being on the defensive for everything because you think it's all about you. But if you look at anatta, that is a word that can be taken less personally, seeing things less personally. You try it for a few days. No matter what happens, don't take it personally and keep track of it in a little notebook and you'll see what, begin to see what I'm saying. But the atta always results in suffering and the anatta takes us in the direction out of suffering. Okay, so if we look where this loops around and goes back here, the full destruction of the, uh, let's see, where did we go? Oh, okay, we're gonna go through chunky now. So return now to the next line. So the Buddha asked us to find, to have faith in, this is the faith of, uh, piece of this, have faith in what he found and try to do his instructions and follow them until you could get the results that are described in the text. Yeah, you're putting some faith in the fact that the texts were preserved enough to actually have those, those uh, results possible. And we trusted that. And at the first, I didn't want to. I thought that was silly, but it's not silly. <laughs> That's all I'm going to tell you. It's just not silly at all. So the return here to this next line here, it, once you have faith, you will come and if you find somebody like me or like Bhante at a temple, you know, we might say, sit down and meditate, you'll meditate. And when you meditate, you will experience some relief. They say Pomoja. We call Pomoja not gladness, but we say Pomoja can be translated as relief because that's what happened to me. I mean, I came out of Washington, D.C. in total distress uh, into a temple and sat down and it was the most incredible experience in my life and so silly that after all those years someone could have said sit down be quiet and just breathe and then it was such relief I slept like a baby that night I'll never forget it and then from there I moved on into a different guided program that the Buddha left for us that was more important to the world than anything. And that program has been turned into literally taken and abused in a way because it ends up being a cherry on top of a breathing uh, retreat or something, but it's not taught the way it was taught in the text at all. And that breaks my heart because of what it actually is and what it's actually produced in people is amazing to me. And so, you have Pomoja is relief. And the next thing you experience is this joy coming up. Now, the joy that you experience that comes up, that's PT. And it's like an uplifting feeling. And when you're practicing, it comes up and it flows up into the head and leaves the heart area. And then people get distressed. Don't get distressed when it, it leaves the heart area. You can always put it back down there if you want to, but, but don't try to keep it down there. Let set this the feeling free to develop. It is all a natural process. We're not supposed to be controlling anything. We're supposed to be a witness and an observer. And that's how the doors open to everything. So when we look at the joy, this is PT and with PT as condition, when that fades away, tranquility comes up. Yeah. And when tranquility comes up, this is pasadi, and this tranquility is different than any kind of other uh, tranquility that is experienced by, by human beings. The joy also, the joy, I want you to remember, there are five types of joy. There are five types, and three of those types are for all human beings to enjoy. But the last two are for those who are investigating and meditating on the mind to enjoy. You see, and the one is PT, and the second joy is uh, all-pervading joy inside, all-pervading joy through flowing through you 
and it's not quite as much as excitement, you know, and then when that fades away, tranquility comes up. And then when that fades away, happiness comes up. Buddhist happiness is what? Sukha is actually uh, inner contentment. And the contentment comes from having learned this enough up top in the chart and put it to use and watched it happen, that there's a kind of contentment. You mean that's what's going on? <laughs> yeah, that's what's really going on. Okay, that's what's happening. Wow. And then you, you, you get, I'm going to keep going and see what else is going on. And then you sit down and you're concentration or we call it collectedness of mind because we don't want you to point there is no pointing there is no absorption mentioned in the text there is no one point of concentration mentioned in the text you see um, and so if you can find it please you know be sure you tell me because I've been hunting for it for years since so many people are doing it I don't just close my eyes to this but it's not there and the, the Bravamsas in Burma can tell you who have memorized the text through, it's not there. Okay, so what is there? In the Vasudhimaga, in the first page about meditation, I go back there, it says you need a productive level of concentration. And what do you think that means? Productive level of concentration is the collected mind without tension and tightness so that you can see the jhanas, as you go through them, you can notice and watch and pay attention and witness the reduction of tension and tightness and the increase of clarity and sharpening of mindfulness, you see, happening. So you can do that. And you have to have that, but you can't be bossy. You can't want to steer it. You can't want to make it happen. And reading books about it is not the solution for you to memorize what each one of those levels are because they're not important. What's important is what's happening for you in each one of your sittings, which none, none are identical. When you go back with the right amount of collectedness, then you can watch your, very carefully as you go through the deeper mental states. Uh, beyond the fourth, John, you have the four mental pieces of infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception or non-perception. The disenchantment happens, begins to happen after you're getting at the point of collectedness. And if you keep going in, in this way, in a deep way, you can get to a place of dispassion where dispassionate disenchantment is I'm not interested in going out and doing all different kinds of external things anymore as much as I'm interested in sitting and seeing how this mind works and how it works with people. And that's how I help people is by showing them how this works and they're not feeling it's a big weight on them what's happening in life. Dispassion is the deeper state where the equanimity is so strong in the deepest part. And by this time you're sitting two and a half, three hours, even four hours. And at that point, after sitting three hours, you can go through what is called the Vimudi, which is a kind of liberate, liberating knowledge thing that occurs. And then uh, what comes out um, as you, you basically, uh, we, we left one out here. I can see we left one out. Um, basically what you have happening is if the dispassion level, and then I guess cessation should be, neurota should be stuck in there. You can put it in if you're taking notes and then you have the Vimudi. And then as you're coming back on, when you turn off and you turn back on and come out and see the links come back on again and start operating again, that's when Nibbana happens. And that is like a virtual, what, what has happened there? What has actually happened there? Uh, you know, I had a retreat in September last year and was with a group of 16 Catholic nuns and it was really fun. And they all did such tremendous progress because they had been keeping their commandments for six and a half years, really tight. And this is their Sheila was just right there, you know. And what happened when they uh, went through, nobody was, uh, nobody was, uh, coming through unless they sat for a minimum of three hours. Now this got me curious. I had been keeping charts 
uh, like I keep, there's like a little research chart project I have for 12 years. And I never noticed this until I went back and figured out who goes through at the end and who doesn't. And no one goes through unless they're sitting for three hours. And it can be that they're sitting three hours and then the next day they sit only two, but then they go through. But nobody went on those charts in like 12 or I think it's 12 years, those charts are long, 12 or 15, I can't remember. And nobody had gone through unless they had gotten to that three hour mark. And time is not a problem because in the process of learning this, you begin to realize there is no such thing as time. It's simply a concept we invented, but there is no such thing as time that it should bear down on you or push you or anything like that. Okay, now we go from six, we go to seven. And we see that the precepts and hindrances and how they work together, how they complement each other, you know, and the knowledge of the aggregates and the sense stores and everything, that's all support material. But here comes another support material thing. Now, what happens is he has to go off to the five uh, ascetics when this happens to him, when he goes through like this and comes out the other side. And he basically um, constructs in an organized, constructs in an organized way an eightfold path. And he starts with your perspective. So your view is the way you see things. This is what we're doing with this and how you see life immediately. Do you ever meet somebody who the moment you say something, um, that's the way they see life. So an example I gave was a warehouse where everybody's there in the morning and the boss comes in and the boss walks up and stands in front of like 40 people in the warehouse. And it, he says, good morning, you know? And he doesn't say good morning. He just arrives. I'm sorry, I'm doing this wrong. He just arrives <laughs> and he's walking in the warehouse and some people will nod and he'll nod back. And the new guy, he doesn't know anything about this supervisor. And he says to him, good morning. And the supervisor immediately says, what do you mean by that? <laughs> this is actually a work setup that I ran into one time with, where somebody was working and we, we talked about what could be done with that. It's another story, but I won't go there. But that's what I mean by perspective. What is your view? How do you view the world immediately in one way or do you have an open perspective? Okay, so that's your view. We're taking that that way. Now, this Eightfold Path is pertaining directly to the person who is in training for meditation too. There's three different ways you can teach the, the path. And this is the way, this way is the, is the way we do it in the most supportive way for you with the, with the meditation. So the next one is imaging. And this is like you, the thoughts that you keep in your mind. That's your business. And it's, it's up to you what you keep in your mind all day. And if you keep unwholesome thoughts in your mind, it pulls you down and slows you down. And it breaks down the function of your brain uh, for the things you need for work and school and everything. But if you keep uplifted images in your mind, this is a good thing. And this really affects our mind. That's a support mechanism. Third one, the third one is um, communication, okay? And this one was right speech, but it, right speech was too confining for us because when we looked in the beginning, we said you are trying to develop yourself uh, with, the, um, with the things we talked about in the very beginning to get you ready for meditation and everything. And when you're communicating, do you only communicate with speech? Ask yourself that. Because the expressions on your face, the motions of your body, and when we talk to parents about this or we watch parents, we're, we're great people watchers. I don't know if all monastics do this, but we have the opportunity to just sit somewhere and watch people. And then watch people, communication is coming from the position of your body. And for instance, if I'm teaching you and you fold your arms like this, I'm gonna ask you to unfold your arms and not cross your legs. Because we know for a fact, through research that you cannot retain the information I give you. 
if you're sitting there with your arms crossed and your legs folded, you already have a point of view and you're just listening, but you're not really letting anything in to consider. And you're going to forget it because you won't be able to keep it because you were the pressure of your opinion was pushed right there. I'm okay, that's fine, but this is what I think. And that's not really examining something fairly to see whether it really works or not. So that's communication with self and others. The next one is the movement of mind's attention. Right action was one thing in the community and behavior and stuff like that, but also. We think that he was talking about the movement of your mind's attention, how mind's attention independently comes up and moves the same way as your eye sees and your ear hears sounds and the nose odors and the tongue flavors and the body sensations, that this is a really important thing to learn how to keep an eye on where your mind is going, because you're the only one that can do that. And you have the power to watch where you play you place your mind and where you let it drift and so then the lifestyle this was life um this used to be just in forms of occupation three forms of occupation not to do but your lifestyle is really important instead of livelihood we took the word lifestyle and we said lifestyle is more important because even if you have only a small two-room hut to live in you have no kitchen you have to walk somewhere else to get your water all things like that okay you can still have a tiny space somewhere where if you're sitting there nobody bothers you and this can be set up where you have an altar in your home and all the different homes that i visited in india and i went in many poor, poor quarters and for the um the different um locations that were extraordinary the living conditions and you know but even so there was one tree with one little bench and a place to sit and i thought that's cool that's cool and if you're sitting there and you have a little scarf on you don't bother that person and you let them have some private time that's private time the next one was right effort and right effort is really the the real the real push for this whole uh, discussion and explaining this in a, in a nutshell is that right effort is what opened all the doors for everyone by correcting the interpretation of right effort. Now, this is just a game. I want you to go to a dictionary and choose a word that you look up in the dictionary. When I was in Spanish, it's, try it with a different language that you're trying to learn. You will find that it has a first definition and a second, third, fourth, and fifth definition. You see, okay. And the 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 baseline uh, word effort can get really messed up, and it really messed up Buddhism because it destroyed this practice. And the last three, six, seven, and eight on the eightfold path have to do with your actual practice primarily. And so this right effort has got to be straightened out. And we're going to talk more about that as we're going down here. But the right effort, because it's down here in number 12 and number 11, I can see it. So, okay, by changing right effort to mean work hard, persevere, don't give up, push, push, don't stop, blah, 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 and say that's what effort meant. It's not what right effort meant. And all you have to do is go back in the text and it meant four tiny steps. And the first one was to recognize when there's an unwholesome mind state in your mind. The second step was release that unwholesome mind state. And the third step, those two steps were purifying your mind, cleaning it, okay, cleaning it. Then the third step and the fourth step were retraining your mind. So let's do it again, recognize the unwholesome state and then release the unwholesome state. And then the next part was to bring up, whoops, I keep doing, bring up, okay, bring up. I can't put the baby finger down, that's really funny. <laughs> the next part was, the third part was to bring up a pleasant feeling, uh, you know, bring up the um, wholesome feeling, okay? And then the last part was to keep the wholesome feeling going and continue on with feelings that are like that, that are wholesome feelings. And that's how you develop 
your proper frame of mind and your proper action and everything. So, and your proper practice, especially. So now the, the next one is observation. This used to be mindfulness, but the definition for mindfulness, we give it very clearly is op, uh, mindfulness is observation. And it's a very special kind of observation, you know, because when you're observing what's going on, observing the movement of mind's attention, observing these things that we talked about in the, in the eightfold path, you, you need to um, make it all come, come to life and actually become actuated. The actuality of life is when we put all this stuff we're talking about to use. And then the eighth part is collectedness. And uh, collectedness, as I said, is our word we use mostly for concentration. Collectedness is the profitable um, uh, level of... Um, concentration, not too tight and not too loose. There are specific stories about monks where they had uh, their concentration was too, too tight. And the Buddha stopped by and said, hey, loosen up, you know. And he, he gave him a story about uh, the man that was the monk. He used to be a lute player and Soma the lute player. And he said, how do you fix a string on a lute? And he said it very carefully because you cannot make it too tight and you may not keep it too loose. It has very bad sound. It has to be just right. And just right is what? Just right means, just right means that you can still see easily and watch easily and observe easily everything that's happening in the different levels that you're passing through the levels in the, um, in the jhanas themselves. We call them levels of um, diminishing, you know, limit, oh, what do we say? Cessation, the, the levels of cessation that you go through and your less and less tightness and concern and taking it personally and more and more observation like the scientists sort of, you know, uh, non-judgmental and watching just purely to see what happens. So that's your eightfold path in relationship to the bearing on your meditation. Okay, the next part, number eight, the, the way to change. The way to change is to change your perspective and retrain the brain. You purify your mind and retrain your brain is how you change your perspective. And it has to do with shifting from an atta atta position. You know, it's like me, 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 <laughs> it's just me <laughs> and that's the way we go through life and we have no other perspective you but we let go of the me 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 part and we decide to retrain the brain um and this has to do with neuroplasticity can a person actually change when we look at change can they actually change and if we look up neuroplasticity in the internet and read some of the results from the research, you begin to understand nobody in the world is stuck. I can't change. That's just me. Who I am. I can't change. I'm stuck. And that is a deception. That is your delusion right there. The delusion, you're deluded that you think you cannot change. But the Buddha gave you step-by-step step the way to change. Now look at nine. This is just a statement that's real important to add here. Okay. Um, pain is inevitable in life. It's just there with everybody, with all animals. Just think about it. It's pain. is It's inevitable in life you're going to experience pain. But the Buddha comes along and says, suffering is optional. Suffering is optional. That's what I'm going to show you. So in number 10, Buddha discovered a secret. <laughs> Nothing is happening to us. Everything is happening from us. That plus the idea of a Nietzsche. If you remember a Nietzsche, why was a Nietzsche so important? Because every, if everything's changing, that means nobody is stuck. You can't be stuck because in 10 minutes, everything's going to change. Uh, I had a, um, you know, a meeting once with 35 adults, and they said when I went in the house, 
um, now the children, the, the teenagers are going to ask the questions tonight. Oh, I said, okay. So I sat down and, and then um, the first in counseling incident was between a mother and a daughter. And the issue was my mother just, she's 17, the daughter's 17. My, the issue was basically my mother and I just don't get along. And I said, well, what's the problem? She doesn't seem to understand that when I need to go with my friends, I need to go with my friends. I need to go to needed to go to the, to the mall or something to do with my friends. And I was getting it. But she came in and she said, Grandma is coming. Can you help me by cleaning up your room and maybe help me clean up the living room and the kitchen some and, and then you can go. And I didn't want to because I had my own plans. And I was very upset. And she started telling me and everything. And then I said to her, you know, she kept stressing how upset she was. And it wasn't unfair. It was so unfair that she was upset. Well, <laughs> it was so unfair that grandma was just coming without calling, you know, before and, and doing this to mom. <laughs> you know, let's look at that. But she's not seeing that part, you know, but she was really, really upset. And I finally just said, OK, if you're upset, then wait for 10 minutes and then talk to your mom and you'll get along better. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, you could come to an agreement, you know, an, an agreement here. You could step back and say, what if I help, I clean my room real fast and then I give mom five minutes here and five minutes there and I bet you can help her get everything ready for grandma to come and then you can leave. And she was, she just couldn't speak. She never thought about cooperating by having an, you know, a, a balanced agreement here. So, so basically what I did was I punched her. I sort of punched her in the stomach with Anicha. Now, Anicha is a funny thing because Anicha is stressed a lot in the text. We get this idea, Anicha is a bad guy. Anicha causes suffering because we have a Nietzsche dukkha anatta. Yeah, we hear about that all the time. But if you are learning uh, dependent origination the way I was showing you a while ago, you will discover if you ask the question, what is a Nietzsche, what is dukkha, what is anatta, you're going to understand everything about a Nietzsche dukkha anatta when you're finished with this program and you start using it because you're going to discover. Yeah. Totally and completely. And Nietzsche is not always a bad guy either, because if everything really is changing, you can go, huh, I'm going to change it. And you just change it. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So a Nietzsche can be a good guy or a bad guy. Is the same thing with the Pali word Chanda. They make ch try to make Chanda a bad, a bad name. At this time, they try to make uh, Chanda to be a bad name, but actually Chandra was wholesome desire. And there is wholesome desire, there really is. Think about it, you can write a list of what wholesome desire is, including your practice, including the development of understanding this, including all of that. But they're trying to say Chandra is only unwholesome desire. Well, that's not true. Well, these were neutral words. Neutral words have, depending on where they show up, what they mean. Kind of like the French. If we say in the West, I love you, it, we only have I love you. But the French have something like 11 or 13 words. I, I just love them. I know. Uh, you know, they have a word for the dog, a word for the trees, a word for everybody when it comes to loving things. Okay, so here we go. Pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. The Buddha discovered nothing happens to you. Everything happens from you. Because of Anicca, nobody is stuck. And then you have to remember, everything is changing all the time. There is nothing. If you find something, you need to contact me. But if you can find something that is permanent, you need to contact me. I search for something like 2,500 miles of driving across three days one time to find out what it was. When I got there, I, I told Bonte what was permanent and see if you can guess what it is that's permanent. Okay, um, number 10, 
the Buddha discovered, I did that one, okay? Number 11, how to practice. And this is the whole thing, practicing. Now, practicing means you do it all the time. It's called a practice because if you want to perfect it, you perfect it by doing it all the time. It has to permeate you. And what does that mean? You have to stick it on the mirror in the bathroom and the ceiling before you go to bed and the door in the bathroom, you know, and the, the place you see when you get out of the shower, you have to put it if you're driving in the car somewhere right on the dashboard on each. Uh, don't worry about it. Don't get uptight if somebody gets in the taxi cab anymore and they get to make you angry because in each somebody else is going to get in and they'll probably be able to be happy and things will change. So you're never stuck. You have to use this, make it part of your life. And it's really a joy if you start to do these things and see how it all works. So how can we practice? Whenever tension starts to come up and tension is the one, the craving and the clinging, you see where it says tension above it, up on number six, craving, and it is the symptom of a rising craving is always the same thing. It is the arising I like want that ah, or I don't like, I don't want the da 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 tension and tightness. The moment that comes up, you can do this. You can think, you smile to yourself, say, gee, I just saw that happen. Just before I was going to get angry, I saw myself get all tight and everything. And then you just forgive it right there. Just forgive it. And you smile and you say, look at that. Skin. Why forgive it? Because it's changing. So forgive it. Number one, you think, never mind, as you recognize and you let go of the tension and the distraction, you let it go of that thought and relax your head. Relax your head. Why? Because the control center for your head and your entire body function is the control center is here. So you let go of that. You let go in the face. You, you let go of the stress here and the stress in your forehead. You let go of everything. And you, how do you do that? You smile more often. And the more smiles you produce, the more easier it is for coming back. And this is not a ha, ha, ho, ho, smile. No, this is just a smile. Laughing at the fact that you finally figured out how this whole world operates. That's what you're doing. You bring up a smile. And as you come back to the task you're doing in life, and then you repeat these steps again and keep smiling at them. And then you have an, your objective is to work in the present time. And the present time is just what you're doing what you're doing. So it isn't that you sit in meditation, and you practice this meditation, Sister Kayla. No, you do it all the time. The students here in Poland are fun. Never had anybody approach them this way. Go down to the beach and not the beach where you walk on the beach, but board, like a boardwalk area they call Sopot near Gdansk. And they decide to smile at people when they're walking and see what happens if people smile back or not, or if you can uplift somebody who is looking devastated and sad. And who is this person in pink shorts and a purple top and a, 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 you know, a flowered hat who's a guy <laughs> and he just wants to smile, you know? One of them got a pink t-shirt with a big smiley on it and was bold enough to walk down. This is a six foot six man from Sweden walking down. And, and people are like, wow, look at that. Just looking at the shirts enough to make them smile. You uplifted them. This is an actuation of Buddhism. So this, what you're practicing in 11, what I showed you is just never mind the negative stuff. You make a decision to do that. This is your ship in life. You're steering the ship and nobody else is going to get up there and steer this ship. And this is right effort. This is what right effort really was. To recognize the unwholesome mind states in your mind when the tension comes up. 
to release the unwholesome states and relax your head, to bring up wholesome mind states and with a smile is the fastest one you can do, and to completely um, purify the mind and retrain it by repeating this again and again. And if you look up what I told you, neuroplasticity over here in, in number eight, neuroplasticity of the brain is about neural pathways. And the neural pathways are your habits. And if you want to change a habit, that's the other thing you can look up in, in, on the internet. You look up, how can I change a habit if I am over 25 years old? And they will start talking to you about the plasticity, the flexibility of the function of the brain. It's not stuck in one position. It's not in cement. And you can change. And the last thing here, and well, almost the last thing, is to continuously put this practice into action by recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat. Hey, recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat. Hey, recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat. I'm not supposed to sing as a nun, but you can sing Dhamma. That's how the children remember it. <laughs> so these things are real. This is alive. This is a living Dhamma. This is what I get so tickled about. I'm so lucky I found uh, an American teacher. I'm so lucky I had someone I could ask constant questions to who had understood and spent the time 12 and a half years in Asia to, to really move around and try to talk to these older monks before they disappeared. And the teachers, you know, today, they're different. And I think one of the saddest things is to have a young monk who is a, you know, you have novices in the monastics, but then you have a uh, junior monk for five years in the in the system originally that where you stayed with one teacher i feel sorry for the bakunis because of what they had to go through coming back because there were no 12 year uh, monks who had could teach them and the problem the problem here is is uh, you know the thing that i never want to say out loud and i never want to hear it either again is, is um, gender equality is the, is the worst phrase anyone could possibly use when talking about the Dhamma, because there is no gender in a monastic. A woman is not a woman, a man is not a man. And they can't stop you from doing the Dhamma and actually going out there and teaching it and just making it all work. Now, I will tell you that the reason I stayed since 2006 and uh, stayed as a novice, as a seminary in that, in that status was because I knew that I could keep 10 precepts and live without breaking any. And I knew that I that's all I needed. And I was able to understand in the first five or six years, moving around with my teacher amongst very high monks all over the world, they would speak to me about the Dhamma and only the Dhamma and discuss it with me for a half hour, an hour or three hours or through the night. If that's what it took, if I was a seminary. But if I was a bhikkhuni, you can get spanked, you know, if you're spending too much time with the bhikkhunis. <laughs> this is not a funny thing, you know? Don't want to hang out with bakunis. Why would you hang out with a bakuni? Nobody seems to understand because we have brains and they have brains and we should just start using them. And if this horrible, horrible phrase, which needed to happen, but not the way some of the women are saying it needs to happen. That's what's such a, such a shame. You know, like I want to be equal to the male counterpart but I don't want to be a seminary for two years. I'll just be one, one year. And I don't want to stay where my teacher is. I'll just wander around and do what I want to do. And if they take their bhikkhuni, upasampada, many of them decide to just 
check in with their teacher maybe once or twice a year and say that they're staying with their teacher. I didn't want to do any of that. I just wanted people to have this. I've been asked to be a number of things and do a number of things in different parts of this whole thing over the years. But the only thing that makes anything matter to me is that people don't need to suffer the way I suffered the first 50 years of my life. So this is how this works. And the only thing I can say to you at the end is use it in daily life, try it, you'll like it. And this is the way to a lighter, happier, clearer mind. And then you end up smiling and there's nothing wrong with smiling. It's a wonderful thing. It makes you feel better. It's advised for your health and so much other stuff. It is not funny. It is just recommended across the board everywhere. So I want to throw it open to the floor. Um, and anybody having any questions? Sarah, I think you're coming in for a landing. <laughs> Hello? Hi. <laughs> Where are you? I can't you're hear on you. Mute. Oh, you're on mute. You, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Sado, sado, sado. Um, sorry. I want to introduce myself really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. I cannot believe my luck. Um, I am. Um, I am actually an agarika for, uh, since March, um, but I am thinking of going back to five precepts lately. Um, because mm -hmm. of, uh, I don't want to get into it, but um, uh, what you said uh, resonates with me so much that I want to cry from happiness. <laughs> um, <laughs> my son is a bhikkhu in, uh, in Sri Lanka. He's a very young bhikkhu, only second Vasa now. And he's friends with um, Biko Ananda, who's a student. I think of uh, Bante Bilara Namsi. And uh, my son just told me about you um, two weeks ago. I found you on internet and I, I'm listening to your um, foundation to Buddhism and everything that uh, first time I agree with any teachings so, <laughs> so much. <laughs> but, um, it's because we pull, pull it all together one time. Uh, I got to sit up with a monk in Chicago with my teacher and we sat up real late and he said, tell him about it. <laughs> I, so I told this monk about it and the monk was so struck dumb because he said, I just heard all 37 requisites of enlightenment. I heard everything, the whole thing all pulled together like this and woven into a cloth in front of me. I have never, never heard this before. And it's right there for us. I just, one more time. I wish I had more time. I, uh, I, so to continue, this is, um, I, I was looking for someone for, for teachings like yours, sister, and I am where, so where are appreciated. You? Where are you? This is, this is where it makes me cry. I am in Poland. No. <laughs> yes. Yes. And uh, because my son is going to, um, he was inviting me um, to some teachings mm -hmm. in India in November, uh, October, I think. And uh, and so I Googled and whatever, and I found that you, Venerable, have a retreat in Poland. And now I hear that you are in Poland. And I. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to yeah. come? You can. Yeah. Yes. You can. Yes. Yeah. You could. Uh, yeah. It's. Um, I, the, I know the, the retreat, the center charges, it's $500. I don't know. It, does it work yes, okay? I you? already contacted because them I and I am. Yes, I, yes. Because I really want to have a female attendant help me. You know, so if oh, you want to come, I put you in the retreat. There's only, 
had only one other woman and I know I have space because I have 11 people. I wanted to go to about 15 people so I can uh, try to, I need to quit, to get you. Where are you in Poland? I am only a hundred and uh, not even 50 kilometers. So like a, less than a hundred miles away from where the retreat is. Oh yeah, I I'm in at, Gdansk. At, I'm in Gdansk, yeah. I, okay. I I will I will drive I I will I will get there I oh, will walk if nice. I need to. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I really would like you to come. Yeah. Probably he was talking to you. You see the um. I was. I think my name is still on the, uh, still on the flyers for the retreats in India. But they um the doctors don't want me to travel. Because my bones are so weak. I'm like. Uh, no, this is something no one has ever said to me in my life. You're fragile. <laughs> and I just like fragile. Yeah, well, I'm fragile. I, I crack my rib easily, crack the other rib easily. And then, you know, uh, I don't know if I have another one that's cracked. I find out tomorrow. Um, so yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not discovering, ever... yeah, not discovering this until, um, I'm in a, a late stage, so there's not, we're just looking into a few things, uh, but uh, it's not a real to be hopeful type. You're gonna keep me here for a lot longer because of how advanced this is, it's crazy. I'm not really upset about it. It's like, you know, I always talk about, I did, I should do this on here for everybody. I should do one of the classes on uh, death and dying because, because uh, the way I approach that is, you know, everybody has a big celebration and a party, you know, when the baby's born, <laughs> everybody's happy the baby came, but then they're so out of alignment with, uh, with uh, dying if somebody gets sick. And one thing we're going to do at the retreat is we are going to do um, the instruction that was given to Anatha Pindika when he was dying. We're going to do that. But it's not it's not the whole thing. But there is a there is a class I teach that is on death. It's basically dying with grace and dignity and a clear mind instead of you know what is this this thing, you know, and um, looking very closely at what it is we appreciate about being born and what we don't appreciate about dying, you know, and and then looking at how this is all balancing out. So, and the other thing is what people should do, and my students, all of you who took part in it, I just want to thank you. I wrote something, and I think Bonte will get it to everybody uh, because I wrote some stuff last night. I could not write yesterday because there was a lot of pain, but I was also crying all the time because I was reading this. You know, they did a really beautiful thing, and they they did a lot of writing about what they got out of the practice and some of them talked to me in the letters and stuff and it was really nice you know because I think we're trying to figure out what to write back to you but the truth is when a teacher is teaching dhamma uh, probably the most wonderful thing that they can say to you is what they they got the light turned on you know that is the most beautiful thing yeah. So I just wish I had that, um, That's the thing that I I found um, I found the teachings and then this morning because um, I subscribed to the channel and this morning I turned on the the um, the newest uh, upload and and I had no idea what was happening and all the all the appreciation from all the students um, made me cry for the best part of the morning. Um, so, well, I, um, yeah, it, it, it was really touching and I was so grateful for everybody that had a chance to take part of it. Uh, one of the things that happened to me uh, over the years, like I were, when I turned on working ever since I began in 2000, I work all my whole entire day on Dharma, you know, and uh, so many people in the States have no idea what I did in this past, uh, uh, in the past, um, basically from 2014, they don't know what I've done. 
because it happened so fast that when I am called to do talking at university and hospitals and go to Singapore and go here and go there, all these places and teach. And then when I get back, there's more I have to do. And I never get to turn in pictures of the retreats and and uh, I don't have a secretary that can sit down and do this for me. And it's really difficult. So it never got done. So there's all this whole history sitting in the computer. And and a lot of it, I, I said to Dhamma Gavesi, Bhanti Dhamma Gavesi, um, I'm the only nun. He's the only monk <laughs> that was ordained by Bhanti. And um, we work together in uh, developing Asia, and it started in India, where I was there for five years. Yeah, and uh, that's that's the living conditions. Just we never detected what was happening, but the water at one point was bad where I was, and I left and I went to South Korea, and stayed for six weeks to try to get healthy and. Uh, that worked to some extent, but we never detected what was really happening and we cannot find the primary. So I go to talk to the oncologist tomorrow. It's like a game, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's just a constant testing, 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 testing. <laughs> and when we went to the hospital this morning, it was funny because we had, well, Luba's great. I have, I have a 25 year old who is acting as my support person who takes care of all of my, um, he takes care of lifting me and getting me in and out of cat cabs and taxis. And he helps me to, uh, which women frankly couldn't do, you know? <laughs> and um, he helps me to manage all the medical documents and help me with the Polish because uh, we, he, he's from Czech Republic. And that mm -hmm. we have in this big apartment here. And the reason I came here was to inject, sort of inject the, tranquil wisdom insight meditation practice into a program of life coaching so that it would spread through Europe and not get lost because I've not been particularly lucky with getting uh, the monks to listen to me and certain people have asked me for years please speak to the monks please speak to the monks and it's a game because of what I just explained to you you know um and I have, I, I don't, you know, now at this point, I don't really care. <laughs> you know, I would just say anything and I wouldn't matter what they said to me. I would, why should I care? <laughs> I would say, well, you know, <laughs> I don't care. I used to say to everybody when I'm 75 or so, I will definitely go in front of 700 bhikkhus and I'll tell them everything I know from this. <clears throat> and one person told me, uh, you know, uh, you, um, you're an American woman and they're going to listen to you. I said, I don't know why, but if you really believe that, I'll do it. I don't care anymore because I've seen too much and I know I can see the ailment and the the, the symptoms and the, 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 disease, the disease that's there. And I can see that if they don't straighten it out and in certain ways that they're going to lose it. It's going to mm -hmm. go very quickly. In, mm -hmm. And the J Japanese are famous for estimating things. They say 10 years, maybe more, <laughs> and because it's already falling apart there. And you can, you can see how it was falling apart there. And that's the largest Buddhist conference in the world. Mm -hmm. The uh, World Buddhist Conference that's in, in Kato, Japan. And they, they don't see it. They think their problem is they should proselytize more. My problem with that is they need to understand what they're proselytizing for. And they need to, the young people will get excited with me when I'm explaining it. Because the, the fact is, you know, if you don't straighten it out, I could approach it this way. If you don't straighten it out, then the Baptists and the, and the, uh, you know, the Baptists and the others that are really got it all together for the families and everybody mm -hmm. in the family, they're going to take people away from you because mm -hmm. it's, it's over because now the people are figuring out that they really don't understand what they're saying or what they're doing in a lot of cases. You see, mm -hmm. the problem is not incurable. The problem needs to come out and be spoken about. It's the only religion I can find where the religion does not want to speak about itself to itself and look, get down and really start working this out. 
The women have made some mistakes. The women have made vast, vast amount of, of, of progress, a vast amount, but they have made some serious mistakes that they don't want to own up to. And the, mm. the statement of gender equality needs to be banned. It should be it should never be spoken again. The moment you sit down with a monk and say, I would like to, I've watched women do this. I would like to speak with you, Bhante, about the Dhamma. And the monk sits down and the woman sits down, the nun, and she says, the first I'd like to ask you, what is your viewpoint on gender equality and the monastic structure? And the monk gets up, it's really funny, says a few words every time the same way, get up, straighten out your robe very carefully and let the person know you forgot that you have an appointment. And then you let them know they can make an appointment with you to speak with you another time. That is vastly different than my experience of going around the world and being able to sit down with monks and earnestly talk about the Dhamma and what it does mm -hmm. for people. The, mm -hmm. the problem I have is that the, the Dhamma belongs to the people and we are supposed to be the pres preservers of this teaching and learn to teach it in a simple way that they can use it. The farmer, the shopkeeper, the banker, and the president, who knows? I've spoken mm -hmm. to all types of people. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is this is an easy thing to learn. Even just one small lesson about a Nietzsche can change a person's life. Mm -hmm. But you have mm -hmm. to learn how to play with it. It can't be something that's dark and mysterious and only allowed to do meditation when you go home and the kids aren't there and you go in the closet or you go upstairs and set yourself aside a particular place in the house. This, this myth has to go away. This, this has to be part of life. And you don't have to sit with 5,000 people to be successful They're surrounding you. You need to be able to sit anywhere, anytime in a train station, in an airport. He used to make me sit in the airport in the midst of all the noise. You see, it's fun. These things are fun. And, and, and the people try to say, oh, you can't have fun. You have to be serious. Mm. Well, wait, <laughs> wait a minute. We are the happy ones. I don't want any of you to forget this. We are the happy ones because we're mm. free because we understand this, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you understand it, you will breathe better than you ever breathed in your life. You will sleep sounder by just going to sleep and getting up. If you have nightmares, you will have the answer. You will know what to do. These things, you know, are really fun. So I would really like to meet you. Um, you know, I hope that we need to somehow, you need to uh, give Banti Dhamma Gavesi. Uh, can you give him the email? Okay. Yes, and, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we can mm -hmm. get you over here. This is great if you're willing to come. It'd be really wonderful for me. I would be very honored. I, 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 yes, very, yes. Thank you. Thank oh, you, sister. sister. Richard, thank you, sister. Thank you so much. So are we ready? Does anybody have any question? We can take one question. Is you here? You got a question. <laughs> that one? Now, one thing you? I'll just tell you that whatever you had um, uh, written to me, uh, we have put uh, that, that your response in the uh, YouTube uh, description. So, the, you, that, okay. So, that, that is uh, mentioned over there. And uh, we have also okay. mentioned all the names uh, who are there uh, in the video who have shared uh, their uh, thoughts. So, those things have been mentioned. And uh, you can uh, basically send uh, uh, me uh, the images which you have, photos and everything. Or we can set up with uh, uh, Google Drive. I can uh, work with uh, 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 Lubir, no? Uh, what, what is his name? Uh, uh, Lubomir. Uh, I can work with him yeah, and just, uh, we can have this. Uh, uh, huh? I got right along. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I can work with him and get them uh, on a, a single place. Okay, so I think we should take this picture that we had today. I think we should keep, maybe we should consider taking this uh, picture and we should put it on a little tiny keychain card or something. <laughs> You know, hook it to your keys so that you can have it with you. You have the whole entire construction of the of the Buddha Dhamma there. 
And all you need to do is start doing it and you'll find out. Siddhartha really did find something, you know, it's like he's not just running around for six and a half years. He really did find something and you can do it too. So let's say a prayer, okay? Okay. Do we have a, a question at anywhere? No? Okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May yeah. beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Wait, 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 that's only There we go. <laughs> Okay, I'll okay. see you then on Sunday. If you come Sunday class, um, we'll do another one. So I, I hope.